necesito una funda para mi ojo. Oh,
Hey, no more sound. <clears throat> welcome, welcome. I'm Patricia Ellsberg, Dan's loving wife of 53 years, speaking to you from our home in Berkeley. It's been such a joy and so meaningful to help create Dan's memorial, connecting with his family, friends, <laughs> and colleagues, and basking in their memories has kept him present in my life. This ceremony is a love letter to Dan, co-created with two marvelous collaborators. First here with me today is Jan Thomas, Dan's longtime beloved assistant, who is a communication specialist and an interfaith minister. Jan has been with us through Dan's last days and she is central to the creation of this celebration. Jan, thank you from me and the whole family. We couldn't have done this without you. <laughs> the other wonderful partner in planning is Dan's daughter, Mary Ellsberg, who uh, worked tirelessly with a whole trove of photographs and helping to make this, make this vision real. Um, she put everything together with a wonderful team into what we'll see today. Before we begin, and while people are joining us, I invite us to take a quiet moment, closing your eyes if you wish, while each of us invokes in our hearts and minds our own connection to Dan. Thank you. It's so special to be here with you and with others who loved and admired Dan. And now I'll turn to our co-host as we embark on the celebration of Dan's life. Here is Jan. It is wonderful to be with you all today to remember Dan. The family decided to have his memorial online so we could be together with those near and far who care about him. We've drawn from pre-recorded tributes to create what you are about to see, a series of short remarks from people who knew him well through the years. We can't do justice to Dan's full biography, but today we'll offer glimpses into who he was and how people were inspired and changed by knowing him. We are grateful beyond words for the wonderful, touching tributes we received, far more than we could include in today's event. In the coming days, more tributes will be posted at Dan's website, which is ellsberg.net. And a recording of today's event will also be available at the website. Now our speakers will take it from here. First, Dan's son Robert will offer the eulogy. Then the rest of the family will speak, capped off by an amazing video from Dan's grandchildren. Then settle in for a journey through the touchstones of Daniel Ellsberg's life, as told by some of the people who knew him best. During a phone call in February, Dad mentioned, almost as a side note, if I had a potentially serious condition, would you want to know about it? I answered with words to the effect, hell yes. 
Thus, I learned of a possible mass on his pancreas, which was later confirmed to be pancreatic cancer and was deemed inoperable. He was told he had three to six months to live. He lived for four. I had known that dad was never particularly worried or anxious about the prospect of his own death. Since surviving the car accident that killed his mother and sister when he was 15, I think he'd always felt he was living on borrowed time. He admitted to me that this probably accounted for his ability to take risks that others might have feared, some of them arguably reckless, such as driving through the countryside of Vietnam and his triumph spitfire, others like his willingness to risk life in prison for releasing the Pentagon Papers served a higher purpose. That lack of fear was one of his superpowers. Yet if the prospect of his own death did not concern him, he spent a lifetime warning against the prospects of mass death hovering over the earth. He stared into the heart of darkness, envisioning a scale of death for which most people have no adequate language or capacity to contemplate. In countless hours in his study, he scratched out thoughts about this danger on one of his yellow legal pads, trying to conceive of words or actions that would arouse humanity to avert the death of our species and the creatures we would take with us. Compared with that prospect, he accepted his own demise with calm detachment, thus foregoing all the preliminary stages of grief that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross famously outlined, denial, grief, bargaining, and depression. What surprised us was something we could not have predicted, his evident happiness, or what my brother termed ebullience. This was not because he felt any optimism about the state of the world. I'm not generally an optimist, he told me. No, I said, you're generally a catastrophist. In fact, he foresaw nothing but sadness and suffering for the future. In light of the dangers posed by the war in Ukraine, he said, I feel I'm leaving just where I first came in. My father was capable of joy and laughter. Often, our conversations were sustained laugh fest. He saw the humor and absurdity in so many things. But none of us had ever witnessed the sustained happiness and enjoyment of life that he showed in the three months following his diagnosis. How to explain what even he acknowledged was a mystery. I think it came from the sense, as he confided to Patricia, that, quote, a tremendous burden has been lifted from my shoulders. He had often spoken of his identification with the mythical seer, Cassandra, who received the gift of seeing the future, but also the curse that no one would believe her. For most of his life, he had struggled with his dubious gift and the driven sense that he must find some way to make people see and act appropriately. He believed that the danger of facing humanity came not just from our technology and our policies, but from the tragic defect that allowed so many humans not to identify with the sufferings and fate of others far away, not of their tribe. He was not alone in his mission, and it gave him great joy to be around those he called his tribe, the peacemakers and resistors, the whistleblowers, the fellow prophets like Greta Thunberg, those he said who care about the others. It was that kind of deep empathy that had helped him turn the war in Vietnam, whose people, he said, had become as real to me as my own hands. And yet the burden of this responsibility definitely dimmed his capacity for sustained happiness, the feeling that somehow the fate of the world depended on him. I tried it various times with limited success to lighten this burden. Using a sports metaphor that I knew was meaningless to him, I once told him that his job was not to get the ball across the goal line, just to move it down the field. Others would carry on. It was a message he wanted and needed to believe. One time when he was feeling particularly down, I wrote him a letter saying, Dad, you should never feel you have to do anything. Give another interview, spend another night in jail, write another book. You helped end a war and you set an example of heroic action for peace that will inspire and challenge generations to come. I couldn't be prouder to be your son. After his death, I found that message taped to his computer. I had the great privilege of working with him for two years on his book, The Doomsday Machine. He once told me that he would be happy if his book could prolong the survival of the planet for 43 seconds, the time between the release of the first atomic bomb 
and its detonation over Hiroshima. Forgive me, I told him, if I hope to aim a little bit higher. In his last months, I believe it was given to him to raise his eyes and see a little higher, beyond the doomsday scenarios on his yellow legal pad. The sense that he had done what was given him to accomplish, the rest was out of his hands. In a letter he sent to friends, he wrote, I've always known that I work better under a deadline. It turns out that I live better under a deadline. That letter, which he posted in March, was a great step on his final journey. I believe it will stand as part of his legacy, a message about his own life, about what it means to be a responsible person, and the message of realism and encouragement he hoped to pass along. He described the risk he had undertaken in releasing the Pentagon Papers and the unexpected results that it achieved, even contributing to the end of the Vietnam War. Thus, he was spared a lifetime in prison and allowed to spend the subsequent years attempting to alert the world to the perils of nuclear war. He regretted that his efforts to dismantle the doomsday machine had not shown better results. And yet he wrote, As I look back on the last 60 years of my life, I think there's no greater cause to which I could have dedicated my efforts. He acknowledged and thanked his fellow peacemakers for their efforts. Your dedication, courage, and determination to act have inspired and sustained my own efforts. He said he could depart this life knowing that others would carry on, and he concluded, my wish for you is that at the end of your days, you will feel as much joy and gratitude as I do now. His letter evoked an extraordinary response, and I think for the first time he realized how much he was loved. This came as a surprise. Yes, people had told him he was admired, but loved? The last time he left the house was for an outing we shared to Stimson Beach, one of his favorite places in the world. It was too cold to dip our toes in the water, but we lay in the sound, sand, surrounded by seagulls and the sound of the surf. It reminded me that his horror at the dangers of nuclear war and climate change were fueled by his love for the earth, nature, the ocean, flowers, animals, children, music, poetry beauty in all its forms, and what it would mean if we were never to see and enjoy these things again. We talked for hours. Many of his interviewers, he said, wanted to talk about his legacy, and he didn't know exactly what that meant. But he told me that maybe this was his message, that you can't know what you will accomplish, and you may not ever know the results of your actions, but the chance that you can make a difference is worth taking. And at the end of the day, that is a good way to use your life. When we drove home, he told me, this has been a marvelous day. That was his final gift to me. The memory of a marvelous day, the example of a marvelous life. To the extent that his joy and gratitude were based on the hope that others would carry on. I pray that his joy may be justified by the way we remember him and by the way we use our lives. My father was a towering presence in my life. He was often very intense. He applied the same razor focus to every decision, whether it was choosing a flavor of ice cream or a movie to watch or ending the Vietnam War. Sometimes it was exhausting, but also exhilarating. For my 10th birthday party, he solved the ice cream paradox by buying a pint each of Baskin Robbins 31 flavors. It was that same year that my father took my brother Robert and me to help him copy the Pentagon Papers. While Robert fed documents into the photocopier one page at a time, I cut the words top secret off the tops and bottoms of the pages. My involvement was largely accidental and it had profound repercussions, both on my family and even on the trial itself. Now as a mother, I think it's fair to question the wisdom of that decision. Steven Spielberg told us that he decided not to include this episode in his movie, The Post, because he thought it would seem completely unbelievable. Dad never regretted including us, however, and he talked about it often. 
At the time, he told us that he might go to jail for the rest of his life as a result of his actions, and he wouldn't be able to watch us grow up. But he wanted us to know that there were some issues that were worth devoting our lives to and even sacrificing our lives for. This was his gift to us. My brothers and I all found our own ways to follow dad's example and to promote a more just and compassionate world. My own path led me first to work as a community health organizer in Nicaragua during the Sandinista revolution, and later as a feminist researcher and activist in the global movement to end violence against women and girls. Dad was always passionately supportive of my work, if not always practical. Once during the 1980s, when I was living in a remote village in Nicaragua, I received a, a radio message that my father was in Managua. He had come because he'd gotten a tip from someone in the military that the US was preparing to invade Nicaragua any day. He decided to bring the message in person and stand by my side as together we defended the revolution against Yankee imperialism. Many years later, he also stood by me and my adult children to denounce the human rights abuses of the Ortega regime in Nicaragua, even though it cost him the friendship of some on the left who still admire Daniel Ortega. Dad never hesitated to proclaim his truth, regardless of the consequences. I felt blessed to have been present with my family during my father's last days. He faced his death very much in the way he faced everything else, with courage, dignity, and immense gratitude for the outpouring of love he received. He enjoyed his favorite meals and watched his favorite movie, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. But until his last breath, he was concerned about the future of humanity. Even at the end, he felt that he had not done enough to protect the planet from annihilation. In one of his last interviews, Dad said, it's been a wonderful party, and now it's time to go home and rest. Good night, Dad. We'll take it from here. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. <clears throat> I had a childhood that was unusual in several ways. And one of these I wish actually was much less unusual and in common, uncommon in the world. I'm a writer, so I'll use a writing metaphor to explain this. Both my parents, Daniel and Patricia, who's right next to me right now, made it very clear to me that I could write whatever book I wanted to with my life and I could live into whatever story and they would love me unconditionally. They made it clear that the only criteria that they had for my life was that I was happy. <clears throat> I'll always be grateful to both of them for this unconditional love. Now, Daniel also had an unusual upbringing in many ways. And in one of these respects was the exact opposite of mine. Many of you know that Dan's childhood was defined by practicing to be a concert pianist around the clock from the ages of five until 15, when his mother was killed in a car accident. Unfortunately, this intensive piano training was not a happy experience for dad. When I was helping dad edit his memoir Secrets in the early 2000s, and we were working on a story he wrote about this part of his life, I learned that Dan's mother had decided that he would become a concert pianist before he was even born. And so it turned out, sadly, that the love that dad felt from his mom was real, but was an extremely conditional love and was based almost entirely on whether he was living out the book that his mother had pre-written for him for his childhood. Any slight rebellion or suggestion that this wasn't actually the story he wanted to live for himself would entail an instant and prolonged silent treatment from his mother until he got back with the program, as he wrote in this story. When I was helping dad write this memoir story, I said to him, this was such an extreme level of conditional love that it strikes me almost as raising to the level of emotional abuse. Does that ring true to you? And he thought about this and he said, he nodded and said that it did. And at that moment, I realized that my father had brought a very strong intention to his parenting of me. 
and that was to never inflict on me what had been forced on him, to make sure that I never for one moment felt that my life was defined by his, even though he cut such a large figure. His only desire for me was that I become myself. <clears throat> in my teens and 20s, I struggled to find my way and to find myself in the shadow of such a great man. I judged my confusion in life and whatever I had achieved at that short point in my life compared to his legendary achievements. During this period, when I went to dad for solace and advice, he once said, the only things you could do with your life that I would have trouble with would be if you became a heroin addict or a right-wing Republican. <laughs> and even then, I would find a way to love you. Fortunately, neither of those life paths were in the cards for me, so I didn't trip his wires there. But other than that, he made it clear to me that he loved me and supported me and showed an interest in my life, no matter how I turned out. Sometimes the story I was living into was pretty dicey. The mental states I was getting into, the lifestyles I was experimenting with, the people I was hanging out with, and not once did he judge me or make me wrong. In fact, dad never spoke harshly to me once in my entire life, 46 years. That's remarkable. Dad was a man dedicated to peace in the world, and he was also a peaceful and gentle father to me. Just there, a loving and supportive presence whenever I needed him. <clears throat> and it turned out that like my dad, I did become a writer, and I did write my own story on paper and in life. And one of the things I'm most grateful for is that in the last few years of his life, and in the last months before he died, I got to show him what I consider to be my best writing. And he said, and he saw that I had taken up his pen, taking the influences he had on me as a man and as a writer and shaping them into my own story with him cheering me on the whole way. Thank you, Dad. I'm so grateful to you. And I'll always miss you and always love you. Thank you. I've thought a lot about what I want to say for this memorial. And I found that the words I used to try to describe Dan just didn't do justice to him. So I happened upon the idea of speaking to him directly and telling him how much I love him. So here goes. Darley, first of all, I want to thank you for being so attractive and sexy that I fell in love with you with our first kiss. I'd been looking for Mr. Wright for quite a while, and with that kiss, I knew I found him. I want to thank you for being such a romantic and the marvelous travels we went on. You proposed to me in the Ganges, and I said yes. We broke up after a while over the war in Vietnam and some misunderstandings between us about the role you were playing there. But when you came back home from Vietnam and came back to me, we fell in love all over again. I want to thank you for wanting to marry me and wanting to have a child with me, even though you have two marvelous children whom I adore, Robert and Mary, from your first marriage. It's such a joy to have Michael in our lives and living with us. I want to thank you for being so funny and making me laugh. I want to thank you for all the snuggling we did. When we snuggled, you would sometimes say, this is heaven. And I would say, you are my home in the universe. I want to thank you for being so dedicated to nonviolent 
resistance. You've been arrested close to 90 times, and sometimes I've been arrested with you. And most of all, what I want to thank you for is your high moral purpose of trying to end unjust wars of intervention and prevent any use of nuclear weapons, and most of all, prevent nuclear holocaust. People have often come up to me and said, your husband is my hero. And I can honestly say back to them, he's my hero too. In the last months of your life, darling, you said to me, Patricia, you have been the love of my life. And I said back to you, darling, you have been, are, and always will be the love of my life. Being your partner has given meaning and purpose to my life. Thank you for loving me and for being my hero. I know that many of us have been thinking about various memories of Grandad that we want to cherish. And there's a few that I will hold on for a long time. Uh, the first one was when I just moved to the United States. I was experiencing culture shock. And I remember one of those Thanksgiving, I was feeling a little overwhelmed. So Grandad decided to ask me to be his assistant for a magic show, which meant the world for me. He was telling me his magic tricks and all the different pieces. So even when I was in my 20s or 30s, if Grandad did a magic trick, which was pretty much every single time I saw him, I would be cheering him on just because it reminded me of that moment when I was a kid that when that talent show meant the world. When we were kids, I remember I got into an injury and hurt my leg and had to go to the hospital for a little bit. It wasn't anything serious, but I was still out sick from school the next day. Uh, and I remember I came out of my room into the living room and granddad yelled, happy birthday. As a kid, I was very confused because my birthday happened many, many months beforehand. But as an adult, I can appreciate that granddad was trying to cheer me up. I was injured and what better way to cheer me up than to celebrate my birthday and have little presents and just make um, a nice day out of it. Granddad strongly believe there's a reason belated birthday cards were created. Um, it's and it's never too late to celebrate your birthday, regardless if it's in the completely wrong month. And I know a lot of us are gonna be talking about a lot of the major accomplishments Granddad did, but I do think that it's also important to remember the small pieces that many of us will hold on for many years to come. It's easy for me to talk about how much I admire Dan. So few people have the chance to know someone who offers such a clear example of what it looks like to live as if your beliefs are actually true. To not only know such a person, but to get to grow up with them as a close family member is such a remarkable blessing. It's easy for me to talk about how grateful I am to have had a grandfather who really cared and understood my work. We shared a particular obsession with the nuclear weapons crisis. And to have someone, even one person, who actually wants to read your dissertation on nuclear policy, it's something that can't be taken for granted. It's been much harder for me to find the words to talk about how much I enjoyed Dan as a person, to talk about how marvelously funny he was, just an endless supply of punchlines and stories that required half a dozen asides. Now, have you heard of the Heisenberg Principle? Yes, okay. What about Greta Garbo? You really need to know who that is for this to be funny. The way he tilted his head back when he laughed or, or frowned when he wasn't sure if you were right, but he was willing to let you explain yourself. The last time I saw him, on the way out the door, he told me I was lovely. And I said that I thought he was lovely too. He grabbed my hand and said, 
Do you really mean that? I've been called many things, but I've never been called lovely before. It would mean a lot if it were true. It's hard to express how much I'll miss Dan as a friend and companion, because I might have other heroes, and I may have other teachers, but no one else is lovely in exactly the ways that made Dan lovely. And I'm just so glad I got the chance to tell him that. I want to take a moment to celebrate my grandfather's life. Dan was often hyper-intellectual, deep in his thoughts about what was going on in the world. But he balanced this with an acute love of everyday experiences, of watching movies and enjoying Patricia's company of love. Some sweet memories I have of Dan are when he would cook total holes with mushrooms for breakfast, which I understand was his only recipe, and all the time we spent talking about politics or just life. I appreciated talking to him, even though, even when we were very young, uh, one felt as though you had to be intensely informed about the news to keep his attention. I will always appreciate the example of service that he left behind. I know that this sense of responsibility might have sometimes overwhelmed him, but it was also one of the ways in which he was magnetic and inspiring to so many within his family, as well as outside. That inspiration will, will stay with all of us, and we will all miss him. There's so much I want to tell you about my granddad, about his, his sharp wit, his generous laugh, his photographic recall, his sparkling intellect, his love of poetry and piano, the way he'd lean in near a whisper when he wanted to tell you something really important. To know him was to love him, and I had the great fortune of getting to know him very deeply during the last 10 years of his life. As a kid, it was sometimes a little hard to talk to him because I couldn't really keep up with that serious analytical side, but I got over that. And as I got older, we bonded over our shared love of classical music. I tried to learn all the Chopin nocturnes that he loved. And I sent him every film reviewer essay I ever wrote and he'd write back as if he were my biggest fan. But when I went to grad school, our relationship grew even stronger when I developed obsessions that so closely aligned with his own. I spent years working on a documentary that he'd appeared in called The Memory of Justice by Marcelo Fools. So we spent so many hours talking about guilt and responsibility, and not only his own sense of responsibility during the years of the Vietnam War, but also my own. I started to feel that I too had inherited this responsibility, that he was passing something profound onto me. I didn't become an activist, and at times I've struggled with feeling inadequate. How, how could I make him proud? How could he know that he was the center of so many parts of my life, uh, intellectually, morally, and that he was how I measured what it looks like to lead a life of meaning and purpose? The last time I went to go visit him in March, I wanted so badly to squeeze out every precious moment. There was so much I still wanted to know, to learn from him. And I realized on my way back to Paris, though, that he had given me everything he could and that I would never stop learning from him. And when I landed, I opened a voicemail from him and he said, Hi, darling, it's Granddad. I love you and I adore you and I have every expectation of seeing you again. And so I just want to say now that Granddad, I love you, I adore you, and I know that we will meet again. I've been thinking a lot about the impact my grandfather has had on my life. He shared his well-known love of movies with my father, who passed that on to me. It's in the blood, he used to joke. And that, I think, in no small part, influenced my decision to study film and pursue a career in filmmaking, which I've done for the last 15 years. But he's also done so much to shape my worldview and sense of morality through his life and example. When I was growing up, I loved talking to him because I always felt that he took what I had to say seriously, and he was never condescending in the way many adults are with kids. Now, this could be extremely intimidating when at age 13 you're having conversations about counterinsurgency or constitutional crises, or when he would earnestly ask questions like, why do you think Germany declared war on the US after Pearl Harbor? But as I grew up, this instilled a certain intellectual curiosity that I've never lost, 
the ability to interrogate your beliefs, to never stop studying and learning, and most importantly, if you're going to make an assertion, be prepared to back it up with evidence, preferably documents. It was extremely edifying for me in the last few years to see Dan spend time with my daughter, Eileen Carroll Ellsberg, his great-granddaughter. It was so touching to see the twinkle in his eye and the smile form when she came into a room. When she was born, he asked me, what was that process like for you in childbirth? I said, it was miraculous. And he responded, exactly right, it is miraculous. It'll take a miracle to save the world, but miracles do happen. They happen every day. When I was with him at the very end of his life, he was in and out of consciousness, but occasionally there would be a glimmer of recognition and he would perk up. Some friends called and he was able to hear them say how much they loved him and how they were surrounding him with an energy force field of love. When they said goodbye, I was sitting with him and he asked, his eyes open and staring into the distance, is Eileen in the force field with me now? I said, yes, she is. And then he closed his eyes and fell asleep. People often ask me throughout my life, what's it like having a hero for a grandfather? I was never totally sure what to say. It's true that he was a heroic person, and his story meant so much to so many people, but to me, he was always my granddad. Funny, brilliant, kind, someone whom I loved, who helped make me the person I am, and whom I will miss terribly. Dan was my father, Harry's half-brother. My father was born Harry Ellsberg, after his father, also named Harry Ellsberg. Harry's mother, Mary Ruth Dill, died when he was five, and he and his sister Margaret were sent to live with relatives. That didn't go very well for Harry. He apparently got in trouble a lot. He returned to live with my grandfather, Harry, his new wife, Adele Charsky, and their young son, Daniel, my uncle. Harry became a big brother to Dan. He and my father clearly had a close relationship. Um, so I felt feel very close to him, if for no other reason than that, I just feel very connected in that way. When Dan often stayed with us, when we lived in Hastings on Hudson, so that he could work with his lawyer, Leonard Boudin, who lived nearby, to prepare for his trial. I was a lucky recipient of Dan's magic tricks, as so many of us have been, something he was known for. He also coached me as I was bullied by my schoolmates about him. Uh, kids in the hallway would say, your uncle is a traitor and should go to prison forever for betraying his country. And that was an example of the type of comment made to me on a daily basis. Um, Dan at home would say to me, tell them about the Gulf of Tonkin and how the war was built on a lie. Um, and that launched a particular facet of my personality, the ability to argue about politics to which my friends can attest to this very day.
Dan's case was eventually thrown out because of the wiretapping my family experienced. You know, and my parents said to me, uh, if anybody in a black suit ask you any questions about your uncle, don't tell them anything. So it was it was an interesting time for me. Dan also role modeled public service and the idea of sacrificing one's comfort and safety for the greater good. So I've always felt that I needed to live my life in an ethical way and according to those values which he demonstrated. All the issues that he fought for and that we respected him for sacrificing his freedom for continue to plague us. So I guess, what is our duty to Dan in terms of the sacrifice that he made for us? I'm glad to be with all of us today and thinking about this wonderful, wonderful man. In his book, he goes on to tell the remarkable story of how he learned that his father was the only person he knew of who stood up against the hydrogen bomb and gave up in 1949 the best job of his life. And Dan didn't learn this until his father was 89 years old in 1978. And he asked his father why he had quit the, that best job in 49. And he said, I didn't want to be part of making a hydrogen bomb. This was a job at Hanford, Washington, where he was going to be the chief structural engineer. And Dan says, you couldn't have known about the hydrogen bomb in 49. And he said, I had a queue clearance because they needed somebody to build the structure. And after I heard what they were going to do, I said, no, they start with an A-bomb, they go to an H-bomb. When are they going to stop? At a Z-bomb? And so I said, I wasn't going to be part of it. And Dan said, how did you focus and know that the H-bomb was so bad? And his father looked at him and he said, because of you. And Dan said, because of me? And his father said, yes. In 1946, you came home with tears in your eyes and you had a book, John Hershey's Hiroshima. And you said, this is the worst book I have ever read. And you gave it to me and I read it. And you were right. Lethal, a, a massively destructive, level that nobody can even fathom. So we were wrong. The creation of the hydrogen bomb that Edward Teller gave us is wrong and it's evil. And thank you, Dan Ellsberg. You gave us knowledge. You gave us wisdom. You gave all of us love of peace, love of kindness, love and respect for human life. Thank you now and forever, Dan, your life is a blessing. Uh, there was a young journalist there at Harvard who uh, knew both of us and thought we would like each other or should <laughs> know each other. And so she had organized a dinner where Dan came with his then wife. I came alone. Uh, and of course, he was at the height of his uh, defense intellectual. Uh, I wasn't fully uh, evolved politically, but I was enough evolved that we clashed. And uh, the thing that was extremely unusual was that for someone of his brilliance and academic record and credentials to have enlisted in the Marines a couple of years earlier, a few years earlier than this, than the time we had this dinner, was, I've never known anyone that did that with his background and foreground. His early uh, 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 orientation toward uh, the grand view of the world uh, led him to have this access to the most secret documents bearing on uh, the uh, Vietnam experience and also uh, the nuclear war plans. And that too 
I mean, is a, um, I can't think of any comparable example of a person that was able to be a, a heroic figure for peace because he had earlier been a leading advocate of a kind of militarist view of the world. You know, he was influenced a lot by Tom Schelling, who was a, 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 I knew slightly also, who was a consummate uh, cold warrior and a believer in a sort of game theory, threat, diplomacy, and uh, was very influential with Dan, I think, uh, more, than, more than anyone else. At, on the Harvard faculty, anyway. Uh, as a rising young uh, star defense intellectual in that Rand world, uh, Dan was given uh, the highest uh, security clearances. And so he had a privileged access to the most the most he heavily guarded secrets. My feeling was that he, uh, that this fundamental uh, transformation was not so easy for him psychologically because mm -hmm. he, ve he had a lot of friends in this other world and he, uh, you know, it wasn't just a matter of uh, a career shift, it was much more comprehensive than that. And he had built his life up to that point on a, a set of beliefs and, and the people, uh, the most eminent people who shared those beliefs. So uh, there was a lot uh, at stake for him. Uh, there was a kind of loyalty that he were, he struggled with uh, for a while, I think. He said that he felt that he had done what he could do in his life and that he had no fear about dying. He regretted uh, leaving those he loved, but that his life had a certain kind of sense of completion. when we were 17 year old freshmen in the first couple of weeks of uh, college. This was 1948, 75 years ago. We were both uh, members of a group of about 10 or 12 people who had won Harvard National Scholarships and we met at a little reception for us. Uh, Wordsworth uh, said that the child is father of the man and from our collegiate days together I could say that the undergraduate is the father of the man. Uh, let me give you a vignette which you may not be familiar with that uh, illustrates the point. Um, one day, uh, the Harvard Lampoon had a large uh, metal sculpture of an ibis as its symbol on its building. One, one night, the ibis disappeared uh, and it became a matter of curiosity among the entire undergraduate population. Now here is a picture of Dan looking in mock seriousness at a sign that says the ibis is still missing. This is obviously staged and very funny. And uh, he's surrounded by a crowd of people, including the ibis who is also looking at the notice. Uh, so now uh, here, so Dan had purloined the uh, ibis maybe with some accomplices. Now here's the second uh, photo from our yearbook. It shows Dan returning the ibis to the public where it will be discovered uh, by putting it a, with an accomplice in an appropriately abstract metal uh, tree 
sculpture that was designed by Walter Gropius. Uh, in order to do this, uh, in order to do this uh, caper, you had to have audacious imagination. You had to have high intelligence, a steady execution, a willingness to run risks, courage, and all of it in the interests in the service of a public benefit. In this case, uh, the entertainment of the college community. Now, I don't, uh, when I say that undergraduate is father of the man, I don't mean to say that uh, this caper is an analogy or comparable to the world shaking Pentagon papers, but there is a kind of interesting abstract formal similarity between the two events. And more important, those qualities that I said that were necessary for Dan to carry out uh, this uh, uh, Ibis caper were the same qualities that were, were what was required to do the Pentagon Papers. So what, what they illustrate for me is the constancy of Dan's character. He had a constancy about him which enabled him to uh, pursue nuclear disarmament for 50 years without stop. Uh, for me, that constancy took the form of our bond. Dan has always kept in touch and pursued and maintained and nurtured our bond. It means everything to me. And now that bond is just in our memory, but it's a very dear memory. I see that wonderful grin of his, that terribly serious expression. And I feel that loving, loving heart of his. A few words about my friend, brand colleague and Pentagon Papers partner, Dan Ellsberg. I first got to know Dan well when, while at Rand, we joined in a letter calling for complete US withdrawal from Vietnam. That didn't go over well with Rand management. And then after Dan's revelation of the Pentagon Papers, speaking out in support of what he did and testifying for his defense in the Los Angeles trial. His courage and commitment to peace then and afterwards for decades has always inspired me. And there's the need for optimism in the long term, despite pessimism in the short term. I do believe that thanks to you, Dan, we'll get to where we want to go. That's Dan Ellsberg's legacy for all resistors. Don't give up the fight, stay the course, be dogged in the face of resistance, know you're on the right side. He always amazed me with his single-minded devotion to ridding the world of nuclear weapons. Like all those who stood by his side, I will forever miss him. Rest in peace, comrade. remember Dan and I do too as very intense and very serious and very focused on important issues. Dan would call up or send a message saying, I need to talk to you. What he wanted to talk about was this perennial question of the relationship between his giving the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times and to the public and the end of the Vietnam War. And as often as we talked about that, Dan was always up for another conversation. The thing that he had hoped for, that is that the release of the papers would educate the American people or the members of Congress and that they would end the war, did not happen. By then, many people had lost concern about the war because Nixon had started taking the troops out and had uh, ended the draft, which was a critical part of this. But it was also clear in his belief that Watergate is what ended the war. That was when Nixon got impeached or when threatened to be impeached. And that Nixon going after Dan and being determined somehow to punish him or stop him from further leaking was an important part of what led to Watergate. And I think that's right. We always agreed about that. And yet Nixon was, as we know, obsessed about it. And Dan thought, and I agreed with that that it was because he feared that Dan had papers about the Nixon administration 
that Dan would release those documents, and that's what made him so crazy and did things that were unacceptable to the American public. And in that unexpected and sort of bizarre way, Dan's release of the Pentagon Papers did play a critical role in ending the war. It was a pleasure and an honor for me to be the one, to be one of the people or the one that he wanted to talk to about things. First um, adjectives I think of when I think about Dan is brilliant and brave. Everybody, of course, who ever met him knows how brilliant he was. He and I uh, got to Saigon around the same time, uh, at the end of 1966, uh, when the first troops were coming, American troops were coming into the country. Um, I met him in the Mekong Delta where there was an Arvin operation going on. And um, as dust fell, he uh, drove, drove me and a photographer back to Saigon. So I got to spend an hour or so with him then. But after that, we talked a great deal. We discussed, but I would say, um, procedural discussion about the war that, that everyone was having. But um, ours was a bit of an argument the whole time as well. I was impressed by him, but I didn't agree at that time because I was somewhat more of a dove than he was. I was impressed by uh, not only that his arguments made sense, but that he was the only man I knew in Saigon who took seriously the, um, um, the thoughts of a young woman. Um, who was then working for Edward Lansdale, 
um, as a sort of intelligence analyst. That meant he could, you know, go anywhere and um, try and figure out things. And I remember that he um, he met um, John Paul Van early on, and Van, who had been an advisor to the Arvin Division outside of Saigon, said, "If you can find out why it is that that the Arvin, these big units, always lose to a bunch of badly equipped guerrillas." you may understand the war. So Dan started pulling on this string and um, very logically, he uh, went, started with the Vietnamese command. He then went to the American command and said, perhaps that's the wrong one. And it, he kept going up the chain until he left, um, Saigon and went back to Rand. And he then understood that really it was uh, the, the president and the people in Washington who were really responsible. I mean, um, a lot of people who went, who turned against the war, but not one who turned against it for these totally logical reasons. And it was very impressive to hear. Giving the Pentagon papers to the New York Times was bravery and intelligence of a different sort. Sharon, it's very good to be with the family and with friends and with those who knew Daniel. It's hard to let go. It's hard to think that he's not here. I met him 68 at a conference of the War Resisters International when JP, Jet Prakash Narayan, was going to speak, and there were doves and hawks invited by the Quakers at that meeting. And uh, Jet Prakash Narayan asked me to say a few things, and which I did. And uh, after that, I remember Daniel coming up to me and said, if you're so much into nonviolence, why are you wearing a leather coat? And so we talked. We talked about a lot of things. Um, about nonviolence and about history. He, at this time of that meeting, was beginning to question and so on, but that was a kind of a breaking point where the second part of his life was where he not only questioned his past, but he betrayed that earlier, quote unquote, loyalty to the state and to empire. And of course, the empire saw him as a dangerous person. And yes, he was a danger to the worst of human activities. The um, central word, I suppose, in our conversations was lucidity. That is to question, keep questioning and answering and questioning the answers. And so I'm grateful that went on for as many years as it did. And his humanity and his kindness and honesty are things that um, I can only aspire to. And I hope that people remembering him and thinking about him don't think of him only sentimentally, but that he acted on principle. And he took action everywhere and for a long time without betraying those principles. And so what he did is not about the United States, it's about humanity, that he would strengthen and support the best of human thought and action. And what more can we ask of a human being? The more of us that we do, we can change the world to what we wish it to be. So he would say, let's do it. And I had these various thoughts, but one of the thoughts was the best thing that the best young men of our country can do is go to prison. When I heard you say these words, I'm going to prison, 
it was as if an axe had split my head. But, <clears throat> but what had really happened was that my life had split in two. You may recognize my name as the once young man whom Dan often credited with inspiring him to copy and release the Pentagon Papers at an international conference of war resistors held at Haverford College in Pennsylvania in August of 1969. <clears throat> Though I was only 25 at the time, I'm now 79 by the way, I was asked to give the closing speech toward the end of which I said that my draft resistor friends David Harris and Bob Eaton were already in prison, Bob having been sentenced in a federal court in Philadelphia just days before, along with hundreds of other young men who'd already been imprisoned for refusing to cooperate with the Vietnam draft. And I said, suddenly choked up and with tears running down my face, that I would soon be joining them. A few months later, when Dan and I met at a restaurant in San Francisco, he told me that what really hit him upon hearing my speech, hit him powerfully, he said, was a question that he'd never before seriously asked himself, namely, what might I myself be willing to do to help stop the war if I too were willing to risk imprisonment? And then, as though in answer to that question, he confided in me that he was actively considering doing something that would almost surely lead to a very long prison sentence, namely publicly releasing the top secret Pentagon papers that he'd worked on at the Rand Corporation. And as we all know, that's precisely what he ended up doing. Finally, the only other thing I want to say here, are you listening, Dan? Is that I have never ever had a more loyal, faithful, caring and genuinely loving friend than you, for which I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Losing Dan Ellsberg would be difficult in any moment. In this moment when heroes are in demand and sadly in short supply, his loss resonates so much more. He was a giant of his time and in our country's history. In 1971, there was a lot happening in America, as the world knows, and Dan was right in the middle of it. People, myself included, were in the streets, demanding, make love, not war. It's the stuff of t-shirts and posters in pop culture today. But in 1971, it was life and death we were fighting for, the soul of our nation. I was in my mid-twenties, divorced and a single mom with two young children. I had my own advertising agency, and among the crown jewels of my office was a rare technology wonder of the time. Not an iPhone or a handheld calculator, a Xerox copy machine. One day I get a call from my good friend Dan. He needed a favor and asked me to meet him for lunch to talk about something very confidential. The journey for Dan to my Xerox machine was monumental in so many ways. He was an early supporter of the war, a brave hawk, who became a heroic dove. I'll never forget those long evenings at my office. I would wave goodnight to my staff who were ever so grateful to go home earlier than I usually urged them to stay. And we'd start our copying around 7 p.m., working till three in the morning. It takes a long time to feed 7,000 pages, one page at a time into a machine the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. What happened next is well known. When the truth came out, Dan was indicted and I was an unindicted co-conspirator. And two years later, we were vindicated and bonded for life. In 2018, I held a dinner party at my home in Los Angeles. It was a moment I will always treasure and a story I will always love telling. Dan was there and so were the four people he describes as the women in his life. Jane Fonda, who he called his inspiration. Barbara Streisand, who when things were at their toughest, held a concert to raise the money to keep us in the fight. Me, his co-conspirator, and the beautiful love of his life, Patricia. Today we mourn the staggering loss of Dan. He made history, and now he belongs to history. He will continue to inspire generations with his fearlessness, 
and the mantra by which he lived his life. Courage is always contagious. I'm forever grateful that I'm a footnote in that history. I love you, Dan, and your magical wife, Patricia. May we always find strength and grace, and yes, courage, in the extraordinary life of Daniel Ellsberg. I was an undergraduate student at the University of Wisconsin, which Madison, which was one of the great hotbeds of anti-war activity at the time. And I was I was in the middle of it. There were a solid 5,000 people who were active anti-war. Um, and we always felt like, you know, we weren't we were doing our best, but we weren't getting anywhere. But then when the news about the Pentagon Papers came out, it was just like a mega force hitting us, like giving us new legitimacy and inspiring us. Who the hell would do this? You know, <laughs> who did this? Uh, and then when we when it came, when the news came about this, this man, Daniel Ellsberg, and that he was going to be on Walter Cronkite. So there was one TV in this, uh, this in the student union, um, and you know people did have TVs, but also we wanted to be together. So there was probably four or five hundred people in this room, packed, packed in this room, waiting for this interview with this person we never heard of, Daniel Ellsberg to tell, explain why he risked his life, his freedom, his job, his career, his family, the likelihood of spending the rest of his life in jail to stop this immoral imperialist war. The force was just massive. I mean, it just changed it, the whole tenor of all of the things that we young students were doing to see somebody with this much courage and commitment and that he was a he was a grown up. He was a high level government official with, you know, obviously with contacts all the way up to the top that he was agreeing with us. Uh, that was just overwhelming. The, the, the moral force of this man was just so powerful, so overwhelming that it was the greatest inspiration of the whole period of the anti-war movement. In April 1973, I was asked to sing to raise money for Daniel Ellsberg, who was on trial for leaking the Pentagon Papers. He believed that if Congress and the American people could finally read the truth about the Vietnam War, they would put an end to it. I immediately said yes, because I was against the war too. Uh, which put me on Nixon's enemies list. And we raised $50,000 that night, a lot of money in those days. And that money enabled Dan to continue the trial for another two weeks, which was just long enough for the news to break that his psychiatrist's office had been burglarized and Nixon was behind it. So the charges against Dan were dismissed on the grounds of government misconduct. And that was the beginning of the end for Nixon. Years later, at a, uh, a dinner party for Dan at Linda Resnick's house, I was very moved to hear Dan say, if we had ended the trial earlier, history would have been different. And all I can say is that I'm very proud to have played even a small part in this remarkable man's story. I really admire him for being loyal to the truth and to our country. Thank you, Dan. I wrote my goodbye to Dan when he wrote to me. 
Dan, my heart goes out to you. You are the smartest, bravest, most focused man I have ever met. I honor you. I honor you for who you are and what you've done. I'm proud to have participated in representing you at a high point of danger and opportunity in your life. You've lived your life as a teacher. You teach me even now as your life approaches its end. Thank you. All love to you. All love to Patricia. This picture, which I can share with you, captures my favorite memory of Dan. On the courthouse steps, speaking to the American people, teaching about our war in Vietnam. Dan was truly a man of principle. He lived it. He taught it in his engagement with life and in his love with Patricia. Daniel Ellsberg's courage changed my life. It was the late 1960s and American soldiers had just convinced me that the Vietnam War was wrong. But I lacked any historical context for the war. I couldn't understand why so many administrations, Democratic and Republican, kept sending our men, and it was, it was entirely men who fought our wars then, send them to Vietnam year after year after year. And then Daniel Ellsberg, committed the ultimate beautiful act of civil disobedience. This former Marine who was a military analyst made public the Pentagon Papers, which gave people a sweeping view of the war from the point of view of the men who were responsible for waging it. The Pentagon Papers became both a tutorial and a weapon for peace. Dan knew, you know, it's, it's hard these days to even countenance this kind of courage. Dan knew that he would risk going to jail for life and he did it anyway. And boy, it, this is a, the depth of courage that we need right now. I will be I'll be forever grateful, Dan, for what you did. And what you continue to do until your last breath, give courage, integrity, and decency. A very handsome face. Laying down his life for his friends is what Dan did when he released those Pentagon Papers. He fully expected that he would spend the rest of his life in prison. When reporters asked him why he did it, Dan replied that there were countless thousands of people, Vietnamese and American, who were dying in a senseless and immoral war. And if he, Dan, could do anything to stop that, he felt compelled to do so. The true measure, though, of Dan Ellsberg's love for his friends which of course was all humanity, came in what he said next. Dan couldn't imagine why everyone else wouldn't do the very same thing. RIP, Dan. It's been one of the great honors of my life to call you a friend and colleague. I knew Dan Ellsberg, it's hard to believe now, for half a century. 
Uh, I met him as a, a so-called technical witness in preparation for his trial in 1972. And I met there with, with him and with Noam Chomsky and his lawyers. And then uh, three years later, when all the brouhaha died down, he moved to San Francisco. By then he was famous, but he also was almost friendless because so many that he had been close to before he leaked the papers would now not speak to him. And some of them, a half century later, never forgave him. Uh, we became quite close. He, among other things, introduced me to my present wife, Rana, and was best man at our wedding. Uh, and our conversation ranged on everything from kind of med club material to the state of the war. And um, what I think we both had in common was that he had been both in government and um, outside among the protesters. And in a very small way, I had been in the Canadian government I've only for five years. Uh, but that gave us a, a kind of perspective on the ins and outs of politics that uh, other people, Chomsky, for example, did not have. And I think one mark of what his, uh, the fame of his moment in 1971, when he released the papers, is that's the year that the Oxford English Dictionary introduced the word whistleblower into the, their English dictionary. And then eight years after that, we had uh, the Whistleblower Act. So um, uh, he's uh, left a permanent impact on how America is governed. Well, I see Dan as eventually being remembered for having had that kind of influence in America, not just in the moment when he released the papers, but in uh, changing the attitude of us as a people to our government and being more willing not just to criticize it, but to act in conjunction. He's not alone, of course. That was the spirit of the time when he did act, but he became a unique actor in that and a generative actor. I haven't said so much about what him and me personally, um, but I am just blown away to have known a man that every time I... I I just, he meant so much to me. He meant so much to me as a person and he meant so much to me as an inspiration on how I should think and what I should do with my own life. And I think that probably most of the people who are contributing to this event today is, is very sad, but also needed event have the same memory of Dan as somebody unique uh, for whom we are grateful. Thank you very much. It seems unfair to be asked to limit my remarks about Dan to three minutes, given the fact that whenever Dan would call Skype or Zoom, Cynthia would remark that she'd see me again in two or three hours. Uh, Dan and Brevity don't belong in the same sentence, green tea or no green tea, but I'll try my best. Uh, we all know that Dan left us much too soon. He was perhaps the country's leading expert on nuclear command and control. His memoir, The Doomsday Machine, is appropriately subtitled Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. But whereas Oppenheimer went from being a leftist to becoming an establishment figure and a proponent of the Cold War, even a nuclear war planner, who even went so far as to name names, Dan became an anti-war and anti-nuclear activist and the world's most famous whistleblower. Oppenheimer went from the left to the establishment. Dan went from the establishment to the left, rejecting all the perks and emoluments that seduced Oppenheimer. Dan was the true conscience of America. He willingly faced 115 years in prison in hopes of ending the U.S. invasion of Vietnam, even though he knew it was a long shot. I didn't know anyone who loved life more or lived it more fully and for whom such imprisonment would have been more cruel than for Dan. 
Dan died knowing precisely who he was and why his life mattered. I have lots of Dan stories, but only have time to share a couple. I wanted to mention Dan's generosity with my students and students everywhere. He used to come to class a couple of times a semester and dazzle my students with his stories about Vietnam and Watergate and his warnings about nuclear winter. I've been bringing students to Hiroshima and Nagasaki every summer since 1995, but in 2006, I decided to take students to Vietnam as part of a spring break honors class. I asked Dan to accompany us, which he was eager to do. It was his first time back to Vietnam since the mid 60s. The Vietnamese rolled out the red carpet for us, but especially for Dan. The newspapers featured his visit. We all met with Madame Bin, who gave Dan an award. And Dan and I were invited to the home of Vietnam's greatest living hero, General Giap, who was 95 at the time and still quite sharp. He introduced us to his wife and children and grandchildren and he expressed heartfelt gratitude to Dan for what he had done for the Vietnamese people. The man who had defeated both the French and the Americans and had known all the world's leaders that it was his honor to meet the great Dan Ellsberg. I almost never made an important decision in life or published anything without bouncing it off Dan first. He was wise and generous and I loved him dearly. Together we dissected every nuance of wartime and Cold War history and solve the world's problems. Ed Snowden tweeted that he had spoken toward the end with Dan and found him more concerned about the world's fate than about his own. Quote, Dan assessed the risk of a nuclear exchange to be escalating beyond 10%, Snowden wrote. Quote, he had hoped to dedicate his final hours to reducing it for all those he would leave behind a hero to the end. No truer words were ever said. Dan was a hero to the end. He was always flipping over the rocks and exploring in these different dimensions of how, how the world really worked and what the legitimate power was about and how we could counter it with a humane approach. I mean, Dan was really a realist who also was a visionary. He was hard-edged and intellectual, and he was also a love person. He was about emotions and about analyzing the process of illegitimate power, the murder that came in large scale from the top. And he brought to us he brought to me in conversations a way to more deeply understand in more dimensions what we're up against and what our possibilities are. Dialogue with people was just crucial. He was constantly asking questions. He was always, always trying to dig deeper about what the hell happened and where are we and what can we do to turn around the ecological and nuclear weapons dangers. I love nothing better than hanging out at the kitchen table with Dan and, and talking. He would have this enormous reservoir of knowledge about the history of the nuclear age and the anecdotes were woven in with the historical context and the paragraphs that he spoke in spontaneously could be really long and they could seem discursive and they always got back to the topic sentence. It was wonderful. It was like exploring into this, what might seem for a moment to be a rabbit hole. And it was actually this crystalline understanding that he could bring in this unique way. He had this unique background of being, so to speak, a betrayer of the warfare state. He'd been in the middle of it. He knew it from the inside. He let us know what that was like, and he let the world know that there were other possibilities uh, without getting, uh, you know, too metaphysical. He is with us, and I feel that the Doomsday Machine is just such an extremely profound book that he intended to be his verbal, his written legacy. 
he really knew that it was what the world needed to know, to hear. He knew experientially as well as analytically what razor's edge of on the side the world is on. He has given the world so much in that book. We're about halfway through the program now. Thank you so much for all of your remarks so far. They're so moving and we have more coming. We're gonna have a musical interlude now that's very special to me and to our family. Um, as I mentioned in my remarks, Dan had at best a, a very mixed relationship to playing piano, but he was a very passionate music lover. Uh, and in particular, he had a, a deep appreciation for people who had a more joyful, um, less mixed, more, more joyful relationship to playing piano. And he always very much appreciated, for example, his granddaughter, my niece, Catherine's uh, uh, joyful and beautiful relation to piano playing. Uh, when my parents moved into this home that we're in now, when I moved in, when I was one in 1978, they bought a beautiful Steinway baby grand. And over the last 10 years, um, I became friends uh, and a fan of an amazing uh, singer, songwriter, pianist named A.D. Bell. And she's done uh, four house concerts uh, in our home on that baby grand uh, that Dan was in attendance to, with, and he always really appreciated her music. When Dan got diagnosed, um, I asked A.D. for a very big ask if she would compose a song in his honor. And, uh, you know, she doesn't normally do requests. This was, a, this was a big ask, but she went deep inside and, uh, and came up with something very beautiful. Uh, there's been relatively few uh, musical songs about Dan, and this is one of them. And um, just one lyrical note that will make sense more of the lyrics. It's also a song about Dan's relationship with Patricia and particularly the way that uh, she inspired his actions. And so the lyrical note is that Patricia has green eyes. <laughs> and um, when we were deciding what to do with the Steinway, um, we thought about it and it just didn't feel right to sell this uh, beautiful instrument that had been a part of our family and of Dan's legacy. And so we decided that we're gifting it to AD and so that Dan's musical legacy will continue through her fingers on this piano. Thank you so much, AD. Children's laughter, happily after, can we avert 
this disaster What is the cost of generations lost? Where is our North Star? Sometimes it feels like nothing will ever change I promise you we will never forget your Truth and justice is never in vain. Truth teller, soothsayer, dragon slayer. Whatever it's worth to be a steward of earth, I offer my lifetime. Children's laughter, happily after. We can avert this disaster. start again oh uh, yeah start one got muted um <laughs> ad dear michael uh told me that you're actually listening to this and i want to thank you for this beautiful song that captures the essence of dan and my love for him because he is my north star um we listen to it together holding hands and it's very meaningful to us over the years. Thank you so much. So dear ones, we're moving into the later phase of Dan's life and his program, uh, where he focused largely on anti-nuclear activities. He said to me in the last weeks of his life, my real tribe is people who put their body on the line referring, of course, to those who get arrested, commit civil disobedience, and the whistleblowers. Now we'll be hearing from some of them, and we want to express from the family enormous gratitude to the Rocky Flats Truth Force, and especially to Jeff Geip for making a short film about Dan and the other protesters there getting arrested at the weapons facility at Rocky Flats, Carolina. Colorado, 
where nuclear weapons were being made. Um, Dan loved being part of this protest. Uh, I think he's never been happier than when he's been getting arrested. And um, uh, we'll hear a, a, a few tributes from Dan's uh, friends and, the, and whistleblowers and the Rocky Flats video. And then uh, we'll be soon closing the program. So here we go with part two, with part two of our celebration. Thank you for being here. I first met Dan on January 9th, 1984, almost 40 years ago. And I was uh, taking a course through extension at University of California, Irvine, even though I was only 16 years old and hadn't graduated from high school. And Dan was always asking questions. And he asked two questions, which I just happened to know the answer to. So I raised my hand and raised it again. And then he said, oh, there's somebody who's raised his hand both times. And he called on me and I told him the answer. And that was the first time we met. And um, I went to do all the recommended reading for the course, but nobody else had apparently done it. So they would just have me get it copied. And then somebody said, wow, you're really into this stuff. Uh, why don't you attend the graduate seminar? And I said, what are you talking about? They said, well, there's a seminar for graduate students. And I was totally perplexed about how a student could be a graduate student, because I thought the whole point of being a student was to graduate. I was very, very confused, but eventually I did start attending the graduate seminar. And after the course, I um, asked Dan if he could write me a letter of recommendation to get into college because I'd been a runaway street kid, so I hadn't really gone to high school or junior high school. So he wrote me this letter and he got me into college. Um, and I eventually came to UC Santa Cruz and I, he was such a mesmerizing teacher to me, and I was so excited. I was already involved in the anti-nuclear movement when I met him. We got arrested together when I was a student, and he was a UC Regents lecturer at UC Irvine. So in 1987, when I transferred to UC Santa Cruz, I came to him and I asked him uh, if I could be his research assistant. And he said, yes. And that started a collaboration that went on for almost 40 years. So that began a relationship uh, that continued up until he died that where he was mentoring me. But then as I went to graduate school, it became much more of a deep and profound friendship. And in fact, I don't really have any words to describe it. Um, he would always call me up. Uh, when he wanted to talk or he needed somebody to do some research for him. And I was happy to do it because if he was interested in something, then I was interested in something. And so through this, we developed this amazing friendship, this amazing and deep friendship. And then there were times when I was having a difficult time in my life when he was really there for me, helping me to overcome a kind of long history of trauma and to flourish. And I felt when I was with Dan, and when I was with Dan and Patricia, I was at home. And I remember that when he called me up, actually, to tell me about his diagnosis, uh, I was in office hours, and I asked him how he was, and he gave me a very strange laugh. <laughs> and I said, uh -huh. he said, oh, you didn't hear the news yet. And I said, no. And then apparently he his mind blanked and he couldn't remember anything. I think he didn't, I think it was hard for him to tell me because we were so close. Almost like our lives depended on each other for a long time. So he finally talked a week later and he told me this story about when the Marines, uh, and he'd been a Marine, when they were in this famous battle where the Marines had kind of mislanded 
and they were in the water fighting the Japanese on the islands, uh, Tarawa, the Battle of Tarawa. And there was this one person who was um, trying to help out his fellow Marines and throwing grenades and getting shot at. And people said, hey, you know, watch out, you're going to get killed. And he said, oh, these guys can't shoot. <laughs> and uh, finally, he did get shot. Um, and they said, we got to evacuate you. He said, I came here to fight the adversary. I didn't come here to be evacuated, you know. And then he's dying, you know. And he says, I sure hate to leave you guys like this. And Dan told that to me. And it was so sweet because he was concerned about the fate of the world. And given our journey together in trying to change the world and doing our best, and I think though I don't think he necessarily thought of it often enough, I think that we all helped to at least buy the world more time. I think that transnational movement to end the Cold War and for a nuclear freeze and its impact on Gorbachev helped to buy the world more time. But it didn't look too good at the time he was talking to me. And so when he said that to me, it was such a sweet thing, you know, about wanting to be together in this battle to save humanity from its worst tendencies of self-destructiveness and to uplift its best abilities of loving and caring, you know? So my friendship with Dan, it, there's nothing like it in all my friendships. And we almost developed this ability to just understand what each other was saying without using words, you know. And I love Dan. And we had this incredible love for each other. And uh, I remember him telling me years ago, um, he said, well, you know, anybody could be a spy. It doesn't matter how close you are, you know. And I said, well, come on, Dan. Uh, but of course, he had particular experiences with that. But I remember uh in the few months before he died telling him i loved him you know and i remember him saying i have total confidence in our love for each other and uh that was quite a that was quite a leap from anybody you know could be a spy or be an agent you know and um i realized that i had thought of Dan as, you know, doing this work, and I was doing it with him, but there were a lot of things he was doing, and now that he's no longer here in the same form, I realize that, you know, people are coming to me sometimes, because they can't come to him, and so I picked up the baton, and I still feel that we're working together. I feel he's with us. I feel he's here, you know, doing the best to change the world and make it a better place, and when he talked to me just a month before his death, and he said how hard it was to change the world, and I said, well, Dan, you changed my life. And so you did change the world. Dan Ellsworth was truly an extraordinary human being. I haven't met anybody quite like him. He was knowledgeable. Uh, he was courageous. He had a sense of humor. He persisted. He, he, he kept at it all his life. And his whole cause stopping the danger of war, nuclear weapons. Uh, he had to admit to me uh, he had failed in that. Very honest person. And at the same time, in talking about the horrors that he talked about, and uh, I think in his library he has books and books on all manner of horror and catastrophe, but he still could summon a, a chuckle, a laugh, a smile. He could see the, uh, the irony, uh, which indicated a man uh, who wasn't just caught up in himself and his ideas, but he had some distance. He had uh, a way of stepping back and, and looking at the world that he was trying to improve. So that, that, that impressed me. I don't find that many people who can, at the same time, almost the same moment, describe the horror, express uh, a reaction to it, utterly human, and yet be able to smile, to see humor in what we uh, human beings 
view and how we find ourselves in this incredibly absurd world that we have. So uh, Dan was a teacher. Dan was a, a wonderful person to talk to. Uh, when he would start, you know, he'd, he'd keep going for many, many minutes. But here's the extraordinary thing. I found, listening to him, he always had something interesting to say. And I talked to a lot of people, and I don't know of any other person who is so knowledgeable, who is so coherent and clear in his expression, his articulation, that I could listen to him for hours. And not just listening to his knowledge, but sensing his spirit, his immediacy, what, what he was, uh, the immediacy of, of that encounter, and yet to be able to reflect on that life where he risks going to prison, maybe for life, uh, to bring out the truth of the lies about Vietnam. Uh, quite a life. Uh, I don't know that there's anybody else around in any way like him. So he's, a, he's somebody we ought to think about, uh, dig into the, the riches of his own thinking and works, uh, because there's a lot there. And uh, God knows humanity needs Dan Ellsberg more than ever. Congresswoman Barbara Lee, and I proudly represent California in this beautiful 12th Congressional District. I want to extend my deepest condolences to the family of Mr. Daniel Ellsberg, his dear wife Patricia, his children Robert, Mary, and Michael, and his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren. Daniel will be forever remembered as the greatest whistleblower of our time. But Dan was not only a courageous truth teller who exposed the United States lies about the Vietnam War and continued to fight to protect our democracy, he also was a brilliant and loving father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and husband. Mr. Ellsberg's decisive action to give the American people oversight despite the risk of criminal charges required a level of integrity and strength not often seen. Throughout his life, Dan was a beacon of reason in the face of unyielding military interventionism abroad, and he exemplified the highest form of civil service. His legacy is a shining example of what it means to fight for and protect American democracy. His bravery and moral courage have resonated with me personally in moments such as my 2001 vote against the authorization for the use of military force. I was fortunate enough to honor Dan not long ago at his University of Massachusetts honorary degree ceremony. His support has always been uplifting. He was a confidant, a supporter, and most importantly, a friend. While we all mourn Dan's loss, let us use his incredible example to celebrate his life and to continue the fight he devoted throughout his life. I know he has inspired countless people across the world to stand up for what is right. May he rest in eternal peace. Daniel Ellsberg came into my life over 40 years ago on a day in 1982. I had a meeting with Ram Das, known as the Meeting of the Ways. We both spoke. And our friendship uh, grew from, to start with from what he, we said that day, what we learned from each other. And I learned a lot from Dan. I learned a lot about the insanity of our country's nuclear program and the fragility of peace, what we called peace. And I shared with him my love for the natural world and the, my commitment to responding to environmental issues. While my husband, Fran Macy, was alive, we had wonderful evenings together as a foursome with Dan and Patricia, Fran and me. Dan and I were always working on books. For Dan, it was Secrets and then The Doomsday Machine. 
for me, it was world is lover, world is self, and then active hope. What's most alive in me now from what I saw in Dan are two capacities, clarity and courage. To see the dangers that threaten what we love and who we are and to respond with courage on behalf of life. That's who he was. Ready to make life shine brighter for us all. How lucky we all are that we have that, to be loved by him and to love him. And that becomes part of our freshness, our availability to life on this planet. I'm Arjun Makijani, privileged to have been Dan's friend. A little over four decades ago, he wrote an article in which I think he made one of his most brilliant arguments, that nuclear threats are uses of nuclear weapons, like a gun in a holdup, even when the gun is not fired. So many times, the United States and other nuclear weapon states have threatened others. And the argument about the gun in the holdup leads directly to an argument for no first use of nuclear weapons. So I want to give you a few vignettes into my own relationship with him and my friendship with him. Um, we always had the most amazing conversations and Patricia often remarked to me that we both seem to be so happy engaging in conversation about the grimmest of topics, partly because it was what Richard Feynman, the physicist, said was fun in the sense of intellectual adventure. He was so relentlessly logical. He knew game theory. He could see moves ahead. And that was part of his how he analyzed things. He listened intensely because he was curious and he wanted to solve the problem. He engaged in real conversation. And, and he was really the most disarming of presences in person. And it was this approachability, this never having let his celebrity get in between him and his goals and his friends and his relationships. This, I think, is at least as amazing and wonderful as anything else. We must solve the riddles that are still unsolved of trying to reach a nuclear establishment that knows that the uses of nuclear weapons will blow up the whole world. And yet we have not been able to reach them. It's a riddle that he tried to solve till the very end. Even after his cancer diagnosis, he actually gave them himself more fully to that struggle. And I thank you, Dan the privilege of the friendship you gave to me. My name is Ivana Nikolic-Hughes. I'm the president of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, and it is truly an honor to provide remarks about Dan, who was a cherished advisor and friend to the foundation for many years. His depth of knowledge, the brilliance of his insights, and his bravery and courage are nothing short of remarkable, inspiring, and astonishing. Any adjective about Dan and his contributions is sure to understate just what he gave to our world and how much better off we would be if we had in fact heeded his advice at every step of the way. I also had the pleasure of being in his virtual presence at two of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation's events entitled Nuclear Dangers. The first took place in April of 2022 to discuss the Ukraine war several weeks after the onset of the Russian invasion. 
Dan, of course, did not disappoint. And through historical analysis and with his moral compass in place as ever, offered an astute perspective on the war and the need for a diplomatic solution to the conflict. The second event on the occasion of the one year anniversary of the war, we made arrangements for the event in January and when it was supposed to take place on March 2nd, it just so happened that only a few days earlier, Dan had shared his diagnosis with the world. And so, having learned the devastating news about his health, we were not even sure whether Dan would be able to make it to our event. But make it he did, and what an event it was, as ever. Dan's intellectual contributions were tremendous, but what made it all the more special was just how excited he was to be with everyone, how grateful he was for his friends and colleagues, and how much love and care he managed to express for people dear to him, but also for the precious world we all inhabit and the need to keep it safe. There was a bitter sweetness in the whole affair with everyone who witnessed this outpouring of affection and tenderness, being deeply moved and encouraged by it, and yet simultaneously recognizing that Dan would not be with us forever. But he is with us forever. Through his writing, his interviews, his lectures, the legacy of activism and care that he left for all of us to continue on in a fight for a peaceful world, one that is free of nuclear weapons. We're all richer and better for having known Dan and must continue on the path that he blazed for us all. I send my deepest love and admiration to Patricia and the rest of the family. This country never had a right to be producing the weapons that Rocky Flats was turning out. Hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of weapons, each one of which had more explosive power than all of the wars of human history put together in one warhead. The message is, we have the power in this country to save ourselves and save them and their children, to act for all the children of the world in this city, this earth, our garden, our home. Thanks for being here. Associated with that rally, we had a civil disobedience action on the tracks that led into Rocky Flats. About 200 people out of the 6,000 had prepared to spend the night at, at Rocky Flats on the railroad tracks in sleeping bags or whatever. Stopping the trains from running with your bodies on the tracks was at least a symbolic way of saying, here's what the American public could do to stop the whole production. It actually started to rain and then snow. This is late April. Heavy snow, which actually collapsed tents that were brought there. It was very severe conditions. We had told them we would leave, but we did. <laughs> then there were those who did not want to leave. Daniel Ellsberg of Pentagon Papers fame was one of 28 anti-nuclear protesters arrested today. The group, which was camped out in the snow near the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant, is being charged with criminal trespass and unlawful blocking of a passageway. I don't remember at what point people went back out, but I think it was fairly soon because I think the next arrest was three days later. At that point, the press started coming back out because this was quite alarming. Nothing has a guarantee to save 
humanity from what they've constructed now already. I'm, I'm an optimist. I think we have a chance. Civil disobedience, nonviolent civil disobedience, shows that it is possible either by truth telling and whistleblowing or by putting your body in harm's way or in danger of prison. You can show a kind of determination to change the situation that is contagious. Good afternoon, everyone. Paul Cox here. On behalf of Veterans for Peace members, we want to express our condolences to Dan's family and all of us who miss him. The world is a far better place for his life and his wisdom. He helped us make sense of our times and led a life of courage and action. Hundreds of our Veterans for Peace brothers and sisters spent time with him on the pro protest lines, getting arrested with him, listening to his stories and analyses, and of course, reading his books. We simply cannot do justice to the influence he's had on us. For my part, I met with him many times over the years, but most recently last year, he graciously agreed to record a short PSA to advertise the Waging Peace in Vietnam exhibit about war resistors that was shown in San Francisco. When the VFP convention was held in Berkeley, he spoke eloquently about the dangers of nuclear war. And in 2013, he rode the back of our VFP chapter's pickup in the San Francisco Pride Parade, holding a poster with Chelsea Manning's photo titled, When They Came for Bradley Manning, I Spoke Out. For all you were and all you are to us, Dan, we love you. Dan Ellsberg was a dear friend over the past 45 years. One of the many special things that we did together was getting arrested and going to jail for acts of nonviolent civil disobedience. At Livermore Nuclear Weapons Labs, where they developed uh, the Doomsday Machine <laughs> that can destroy life on our beautiful planet, uh, over a thousand of us were arrested in June of, of 1983. And uh, there was no room in the jail, so they uh, put 500 of us uh, into a big, of, of us men, into a, a large circus tent, where uh, instead of feeling sorry for, our, for ourselves, where we spent two weeks, uh, we did all kinds of workshops and sharing life stories. And uh, Dan did a teach-in uh, every day for uh, about an hour. Uh, and as a result, we all got very well educated uh, about, <laughs> about the nuclear arms race. Dan and I were also arrested in, uh, in protesting uh, many wars. And one of them was the Iraq War in 2003, where uh, when the United States started the shock and awe bombing of uh, Iraq destroying not only cities, but uh, men, women, children. And uh, we uh, did uh, die-ins uh, in, in the financial district of San Francisco. And many of us were also arrested on March 19th, on the anniversary of the beginning of the Iraq War. And uh, on one of those arrests, uh, Dan and I were uh, taken to jail, and when the woman uh, was fingerprinted and said, Mr. Ellsberg, it's an honor to, <laughs> to, to fingerprint you. And then they took us to the jail cell, and uh, one after another of the prison guards from all over the jail came to pay their respects to Dan uh, and said, uh, Mr. Ellsberg, we're so appreciative of your life's work. Well, Dan's spirit, his courage, his example, and his wisdom 
were a beautiful gift to all of us. And courage is contagious. Dan's love for family and friends and all humanity was at the heart of his lifelong work to stop the nuclear arms race and work for the abolition of all nuclear weapons. Hi friends, I'm John Deere and my thanks to Patricia, Robert, Mary and Michael for sharing Dan with all of us all these years. To me, Dan was a holy prophet of peace. He was like Isaiah calling us to beat swords into plowshares and to study war no more. He's like Ezekiel describing the nightmarish vision of a field of dry bones as an image of nuclear winter. He's most like Jonah who walked across Nineveh calling everyone to repent of their violence. Only Dan crisscrossed the U.S. constantly and called Americans to repent of the mortal sin of war and nuclear weapons. Dan wanted all of us, like the people of Nineveh, to disarm our nuclear arsenal. So we spoke out publicly and relentlessly and tirelessly. And I hope now we can all start speaking out like him and become like Jonah and Dan, prophets of peace to this world of permanent war headed toward the brink. Dan was deadly serious about the urgent need to abolish nuclear weapons. And he's teaching me to wake up and be just as serious. I remember in 1995 when we worked really hard to stop the Smithsonian Museum's awful messaging around the Enola Gay exhibit. We held this big press conference and afterwards I went up to thank him and he stopped me in mid-sentence and said, there's nothing to thank me for, John. I really want to get rid of nuclear weapons. So we really have to keep at them for the rest of our lives till they're gone. And I just looked at him. I was so moved and I've never forgotten his single-mindedness and his determination. And I saw him all these years up till the day he died when he was preparing to go on 60 Minutes with that same passion. And I hope we can all be as serious as Dan in our commitment to peace and disarmament. Finally, I think he was a true peacemaker then who taught us not to bomb or kill or wage war but how to live well and seek and speak the truth and work for peace and then to die well in the spirit of peace, love, and joy. So we thank the God of peace for our friend Dan, and I hope and pray we can all carry on his great work of peace and do our part for the abolition of nuclear weapons and war itself and create a whole new culture of nonviolence, justice, and peace. And may the God of peace bless us all. Thank you. Hi, I'm Trevor Tim, Executive Director of Freedom of the Press Foundation. And my favorite memory of, of Dan actually happened uh, over 10 years ago. It was the summer of 2013. And I went to visit him at his house. He had uh, been feeling uh, quite ill. He had been uh, on the East Coast for the previous week attending the trial of Chelsea Manning. And of course, in typical Dan fashion, he wasn't just attending the trial. He was appearing on television defending uh, Chelsea's decision to come forward. He was doing panels. He was speaking at protests. Um, but he had run himself ragged. You know, I think at one point he may have collapsed. There was a problem with his, uh, with his pacemaker. And his doctor had essentially ordered him to uh, lay in his recliner all day until they could get his pacemaker fixed. Um, anytime he stood up, he, his heart would start racing um, and he would put himself at serious risk. Um, and so, you know, as he was recounting, uh, you know, what was happening, uh, what had happened uh, to me, I was also telling him what I knew about this other incredible story that was unfolding where two of our fellow board members and co-founders at, at Freedom of the Press Foundation, uh, Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald, uh, had been publishing story after story uh, about secret NSA surveillance, uh, apparently uh, from documents that had been given to them by a mysterious whistleblower. Um, and you know, as I was talking, Dan kind of instinctually got out of his his chair and you know quickly realized what he was doing because his heart would start racing. And then he got a phone call, which he picked up immediately um, from an unknown number. And, you know, I could hear the other end of the line. It was uh, a CNN producer. It was somebody said, you know, I'm so-and-so from CNN. Do you have any comment on Edward Snowden? And Dan said, who's Edward Snowden? 
Um, it had turned out, as we were talking, Glenn and Laura had published the very first piece revealing who Edward Snowden was. And so Dan said, you know, I'll, I'll call you back. And so he hung up and I read him the story that Glenn and Laura had just published, and which talked about uh, Snowden's motivations. And you could just see Dan light up and you could see uh, the life come back into him. And uh, as soon as I was done, he immediately jumps out of his chair and it felt like sprinted to his closet to find a suit. He called back CNN quickly and within 15 minutes, he was about to get in a car to, to go uh, off to do an interview. Uh, and I was standing there kind of worried for his life. Um, and so, uh, you know, we said our goodbyes and he would do multiple CNN interviews that day. He would wake up at four in the morning and he was on the, he was the lead guest on Democracy Now! Um, and he also somehow had an op-ed uh, in The Guardian, um, you know, by 7 or 8 a.m. in the morning. So far from, far from killing him, this really gave him life. And, you know, for the next 10 years, uh, I don't think he stopped once fighting for those who followed in his footsteps. It is an honor for me to be a part of this well-deserved tribute to Daniel Ellsberg. Prior to Daniel coming into my life, I knew of him as the quintessential whistleblower, someone who dared to stand up and speak truth to power. When I found myself being persecuted by a vengeful government wielding the Espionage Act, he became that much more important to me. When I emerged from prison, feeling betrayed and lost and hopeless, Daniel took it upon himself to reach out to me. Oh, he shared with me his experiences of being unjustly labeled a traitor and all of the devastations that go along with it. I found a kinship with this great, eloquent man and by his sharing with me what he went through, you know, he uplifted me, he uplifted my spirit. You know, he made me feel and realize that I wasn't alone. You know, most, more importantly, he made me realize that I was much more than the ordeal that I had been subjected to and also that I had survived it. You know, that sometimes that's all you need is for someone to listen and understand. Daniel was there for me in that most crucial way. And he was also there for other whistleblowers in that same important, all important way. Daniel told it like it was. And whether it involved Vietnam, nuclear weapons, whistleblowers, or the myriad other issues that he championed, his unapologetic honesty benefited us all. I'm honored that Daniel Ellsberg was part of my life. I'm honored again to, to say thank you uh, to Daniel and that he is sorely missed, but you know, his truth lives on. That is what meant the most to me was his generosity and his graciousness, his interest in me and in others. And I think a lot of us would say that he was the most intelligent person we ever met. He was the most courageous person, uh, but he also certainly was one of the most uh, gentle and uh, loving people I've met and certainly very gracious uh, to me over and over and over again and reminds me so much of what uh, St. Francis de Sal said uh, that nothing is so strong as gentleness, nothing so gentle as real strength. And I really think that summarizes Dan and uh, I'm going to miss him and my condolences to his family and to all who loved him and to all that he inspired. Dan Ellsberg is a friend I never thought in a million years that I would actually have. 
I was a double major in college at Syracuse um, or science and journalism. And so I was aware of who Dan was my entire life. And he was always a hero. And in the worst moment of my life, Dan entered. And it's really hard to be someone who goes through the kinds of things that whistleblowers go through. It's not something that anyone else can understand except those who have been through it. And I remember right after my house was ready, he called me and I was stunned. I was, I was completely starstruck and that's never happened to me before. And I was just listening to him talk to me on the phone for hours and sharing his experiences. And I couldn't believe that this was a person who thought that I was worthy of his friendship and his time. After that moment, he became the person that I called in the worst and the best moments of this journey. And one of my favorite memories is when I reached out to him after I got official legal whistleblower protection and he um, messaged me back saying that uh, he didn't even know that was a thing that you could get. And um, I'm going to miss him. I already miss him. I miss his guidance. I miss his outlook on life. There are some people who come into this world and they can define a generation. They can change the course of history. They can be world shapers. And that's who Dan was. Dan is a person can't be replaced or copied. The world suffers a loss without him, but hopefully those of us who knew him can pick up that torch and continue to fight for the things that he chose to define his life with. My name is Edward Snowden, and uh, Daniel Ellsberg was a friend of mine. He was uh, perhaps the man that I, I admired more than any other. Um, I didn't actually meet him until fairly late in my, uh, my life, a few years after I came forward to blow the whistle on the revelations of mass surveillance uh, regarding government secret activities. Uh, and so we had a kind of kinship where I had known him uh, before I'd ever met him through his work, uh, through a film uh, documentary called The Most Dangerous Man in America, uh, that I watched when I was agonizing over my own uh, internal decision about what I should do when I found the government uh, had been breaking the law, violating the Constitution, and so on. And it was a tremendous comfort to me, uh, and an encouragement to me, and an inspiration uh, that guided my thinking to realize that uh, <laughs> before I had been born, uh, there was a man who was creating a new model for how to hold the government accountable, uh, despite its best efforts uh, to keep its activities in the dark. Now, when I finally met him, he said he'd been waiting 40 years uh, to, to see someone like me. When we looked at the government as it is and how, how these things could continue, how these wars can be prosecuted, how these programs can be hidden, uh, and it's, it's not a uniquely American problem, you know, this is a global problem, it's a human problem. It's that people tell themselves in an office, in an institution, in a big organization, it doesn't have to be the government, uh, that yeah, there are problems, we recognize them, we see them, but it, it can't be helped. It's not our job to fix it, nobody's coming to fix it. Uh, and, and so you tacitly accept it. You don't like it. You don't have to endorse it, but you just go, uh, let's focus on the task at hand. And through that, we subordinate our thinking to the thinking of the taskmaster. And it becomes very comfortable. It becomes very natural. It's uh, <laughs> like the movements of the, the, the sun and the moon. It may not be something that we love, but it is something that we understand. What I admired so much about uh, Dan is that he understood in a way that very few do, uh, that it can be helped. And the person that you are waiting for to fix it 
can be you. And what we think as heroes are, are just people like you and me who see something, they feel that comfort, they know it's not their job, but they realize somebody has to do it and it can be them. That's what he did. Uh, you know, Nixon called him the most dangerous man in America. But the most dangerous man to the state was the most indispensable to the nation. And I will always miss him, but I'm glad we had him. My love and deepest feelings to Patricia, Michael, and other family members, as well as friends and admirers worldwide of Dan Ellsberg. The utmost conscience and the great peace worker of the United States. In, in mid 1990s, I heard about the so called Manhattan Project 2 Dan Ellsberg was initiating. Dan explained that the original Manhattan Project was to develop atom bombs and his Manhattan Project 2 calls for bringing the number of nuclear weapons to near zero and eventually to zero. It's a great vision even now. As Secretary of Plutonium Free Future, I ran into Dan in many conferences, public hearings and demonstrations against nuclear weapons. Dan was always extremely knowledgeable, articulate, and passionate. He was a great leader of peace movement against nuclear weapons. In his book, he speaks of his conversion from a military advisor of President Kennedy to an anti-nuclear weapons activist. I was very inspired and created a row of calligraphy in ideographs saying saving hundreds of millions of people's lives is a bodhisattva action. Action by Dr. Daniel Ellsberg, witnessed by Iki Sanjin, one mountain person, my artist name. Uh, in May of this year, I presented the school to Patricia and Dan, and we had a most delightful conversation. Dan has gone on a journey to another shore. But the uh, enormous vision of a nuclear free world by Dan Ellsberg will continue and expand with all of us. When Daniel Ellsberg landed in Sweden on a cold and frosty morning in January 2019. His first words to me were, I must see Greta Thunberg. Then came to Stockholm with Patricia to receive the Olaf Palme Prize for his deep humanism, his extraordinary courage. In his acceptance speech on January 30th, Dan warned anew of global annihilation as a consequence of the nuclear weapon state's refusal to follow through on the promise of a world without nuclear weapons. He recalled Prime Minister Palmer's opening speech at the first United Nations Environmental Conference in Stockholm in 1972. 
Palmer spoke of the threat of the coming ecocide and alluded to the American chemical warfare in Vietnam, President Nixon reacted with anger. Dan asked what Palmer would have said today about the situation regarding the UN nuclear weapons ban. He sensed the answer. Palmer had in his last speech at the UN in 1985 pleaded for a general ban on the doomsday weapons and stated the nuclear weapon states are holding us non-nuclear weapon states hostage. Dan added, heed Palmer's warning, do not silence his voice in today's world. And he said to Greta Thunberg, your fight for the environment is as important as the fight against nuclear suicide. And it gives me great pleasure to say that today in Sweden, the doomsday machine has come out in a Swedish version. We must draw inspiration from Daniel Ellsberg against disaster and death for love and life. I got to know Dan in 2006. He was nominated for the Right Livelihood Award that year. And one of the letters of support for the nomination from an earlier Right Livelihood, Laureate Mordecai Vanunu, who wrote about how important the support and correspondence with Dan had been for him when he was in prison for his own whistleblowing about the Israeli nuclear weapons program. Dan received the award that same year, as our jury expressed it at the time, for putting peace and truth first at considerable personal risk and dedicating his life to inspiring others to follow his example. This was six years into the Bush administration, three years after the illegal American invasion of Iraq. Dan used the attention around the award to warn of an American attack against Iran and to call upon American officials who had access to these war plans to share them with the public. To me, it feels like through Dan, through, through our many conversations and by reading his books and article, I got to understand America at its best and at its worst. The, the best of rational thought and analysis and, and determination to apply them at massive scale for a goal that you believe in, but also the worst kind of hubris and, and sense of supremacy and disregard and ignorance about what is seen as the other. And I'd say he helped me understand how power can exploit the best kind of people to serve the worst kind of goals. By playing on the intellectual fascination of being at the cutting edge of a developing field and their fear to lose access to information and become an outcast from their peer group. The last time that I met Dan was in Stockholm in early 2019. He was there to receive the Olaf Palme Award. It was a few months after Greta Thunberg had started protesting outside the Swedish parliament every Friday. And there was no person that Dan wanted to meet more during his time in Stockholm than her. And so we went on a Friday morning and he joined Greta's protest outside the Swedish parliament. They spoke for some time and, and I think he tried to convince her to also start a youth movement to free the world of nuclear weapons. People like Dan, like Greta, like other Right Livelihood laureates help us make sense of the crazy state of global affairs and offer moral and intellectual guidance to us. And most importantly, that they demonstrate how much power every one of us has to change the world if we're prepared to pay the price. I so admired Greta for bringing the world's attention and waking them from sleepwalking. Uh, on the issue of climate change and showing the way here that one person can start a movement uh, and uh, save us. It, it will, after all, take her generation, I believe, to save the world because my generation and one or two after it have totally failed their obligations to act as she is doing. The very fact that Greta on her own realized no one else is conveying this message. No one else is protesting in the way. So it's up to me to do it. And that's what each person can think of. As they look around, they can see sleepwalking on every hand. 
and one person can waken those near them and that can go in a chain reaction uh, of a good kind that can actually save the world. Hi, I'm Judith Ehrlich, and I'm very honored to be part of this tribute to Dan Ellsberg. He's been my muse as a filmmaker for the past 15 years. I've made three films about him. The first, The Most Dangerous Man in America, Daniel Ellsberg, and The Pentagon Papers was seen by many people around the world. But you may not know that Edward Snowden was inspired to leak the secrets he had because of seeing the film about Dan. And the second film I made was The Boys Who Said No, a film that focuses on the young war resistors who inspired Dan initially to be willing to go to prison to stop the war. And this, the third was a recent um, animated podcast of Dan's ideas about how to defuse the threat of nuclear war. Just one really quick story. I was looking at some footage for a film I'm working on, inspired by Dan, of course, about whistleblowers. And we were at a large gathering at the St. John's Presbyterian Church in Berkeley. And at the end of the event, Dan says, um, how many people in the room have been arrested with me? And hands go up all over the room. And he said, gee, I thought it would be more. But don't worry, you'll have another chance. Not long after that, it was his 80th birthday, and I remember saying to Dan, you know, you've been arrested 80 times as far as I can gather, and I would be great. The symmetry, if you're 80 times arrested at your 80th birthday, could you? do you think you could not get arrested in the next couple months? And he went, Judy, I can't do that. And in fact, he was arrested twice in the two months between that conversation and his birthday party. Dan had an ability to scare the pants off of everybody in the room when he started telling stories about nuclear war. He also delighted with his ability to recite poetry, knowing hundreds of poems by heart, and he would often end the evening with a magic trick. He was something to everyone and to me a great friend and a great mentor, and um, I was very honored to, to know Dan Ellsberg. I met Dan in 2009 through a documentary about him, and that encounter changed my life in so many ways. He showed me a different way of thinking about the world and my relationships with the people in it. He taught me about integrity in a profound way. Over many years, from 2009 until his death, we worked together on hundreds, maybe thousands of interviews, media appearances, and essays of every magnitude. Disseminating his anti-war message through mass media and the free press was his indefatigable mission, and it was an honor of my life to be a small part of upholding that mission with him. Most importantly, for me personally, was the way Dan simply believed in me, had faith in me, and put his total trust in me to work with him side by side for 14 years. Working with Dan, being his friend, and serving as a channel for his message his intellect, and his fight for peace has been one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. I will do my best to remain faithful to the cause and to his message of peace. Dan is a national hero, but he's also my personal hero. I really will love Dan always as family. Hi, I'm Paul Jay. And I had the privilege of knowing Dan over the last few years while making my film, How to Stop a Nuclear War, which is based on Dan's book, Doomsday Machine. Dan changed my life. I was as much in denial about the dangers of nuclear war as most others, although I guess many people on this Zoom call were more tuned in to that than I was. But when I read the book in 2018, it scared the shit out of me. And I felt like it was the most important book I'd ever read because of what's at stake. I realized that making this film would probably be the most important thing to do. What drew me to Dan was his total commitment to what he believed in and his willingness to change course when reality asserted itself, when he thought that Stalin and the Soviet Union were the same threat to the world that Hitler was. He wasn't just a cold warrior, he was an all-in cold warrior hawk. 
He could have been a Nobel Prize winning academic. He could have done just about anything, I guess. He had one of those generational brains. But he decided to put his analytical skills at the service of fighting what he thought was a threat to humanity. And he goes to RAND Corporation and he becomes a nuclear war planner. He worked at RAND to stop what he thought was going to be the next Pearl Harbor. And it wasn't just an abstract question for him, it was a thing he committed his life to and it became part of who he was, part of his identity. But when he started to realize that the missile gap was a lie and discovered the horror of American nuclear war plans, it started a process of questioning everything he believed in. He said in one of the interviews that he started to realize that he was living an illusion, a delusion, a lie. And this went against everything he had grown to believe. He realized that he had been committed to a whole series of falsehoods. And as he said, falsehoods that made some people a lot of profit. Instead of clinging to this identity, he went where the trail of facts led. He transformed himself from a militant cold warrior to an anti-nuclear war activist. And that takes a lot of courage. But it takes a lot of courage to admit to yourself that more or less much of what you believed about the world had been wrong. The other thing Dan taught me was he still found a place for joy in his life. As you know, Dan could talk about the most horrendous things and then break out in a big smile. When I asked him the question, how do you keep smiling throughout all this? How do you have such a sense of joy when you know what's coming? And he said it was because of Patricia. He had his love with him. She was a great influence on his thinking and a great sounding board. And I think it's her transcendent spirit that helped Dan face the harshest truths without despair. So with all that said, when I think of Dan's sense of joy and love of life, here's an image of Dan I'll never forget. Drive safe, man. I met Dan in 1999 um, when I first asked him for an interview and we talked then for many hours and have talked for many more hours since. Dan's uh, generosity uh, with his time was really staggering. Over the decades, uh, he, he talked with countless writers, reporters, historians, activists, journalists, and talked with them and he informed them and he inspired them uh, and um, he really just had a remarkable impact on, on so many people, often really in person. And in the final years in, uh, during the pandemic, one Zoom after another. I valued him and his example in so many different ways, especially admired his combination of um, passion and uh, intellect. You know, he was such a supremely uh, gifted intellectual. I, I sometimes think people um, didn't fully grasp how, how much um, em emotion and feeling uh, drove his thinking or were actually really inseparable from his thinking. He, he really uh, was able to combine heart and head in whatever he did, whether it was giving a lecture or engaging in an act of civil disobedience. I was also uh, deeply inspired by his sheer energy and enthusiasm and relentless curiosity about whatever engaged him. I mean, even, even in his 92nd year, he was always reading five or six books at a time. And it, it felt to me like he was offering a kind of permission and encouragement to strive for his level of intense engagement. Of course, he set an impossibly high bar, but I will forever um, be inspired by his example. It, getting to know Dan and learning from him and, and becoming his friend really was one of the great gifts of my life. Dan had this uh, amazing ability to always be rethinking uh, the meaning of his life and the, the meaning of, of the history he cared about so that when he was answering a student 
this question, it was almost as if you could really see the, uh, the wheels turning as he tried to in incorporate into his answer some new insight he had gotten from the morning news or you know, some book he had been reading at two in the morning the, the last night. So um, he really did have a, a, a remarkable impact on students uh, for whom uh, knowing him uh, not only inspired them, but really um, gave them a gift which he gave to all of us, which, which is to challenge us to, to think about what we might do, how we might uh, act, what risks we might be willing to take to make uh, a better world. I'll, I'll close with one of um, Dan's favorite lines uh, from Henry David Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience. Thoreau, Thoreau wrote, cast your whole vote, not a strip of paper merely, but your whole influence. Well, Dan, always cast his whole vote. I have so many memories of Dan that I love. I loved his sense of humor. Nobody could tell a joke better than Dan. And sometimes they were his own. He didn't even have to hear them from someone else. I remember at his 60th birthday party, Ramdas was there, um, Alpert, Richard Alpert from of LSD fame. And uh, Dan and he were going back and forth and it was so funny. It was so, it, it was so intense and at the same time profound. And Dan really started to riff on something important to him when suddenly there was a fire uh, on the stove and people were rushing about and trying to extinguish it and Dan looked, saw it, and continued with his, not a, it was not a monologue, it was a dialogue. And Richard did too, and I was listening. And it was just lovely to see. And nobody remembers the fire today, but they remember what Dan said. So, so many memories like that. What did he mean to me? Well, he was my closest friend. I could tell Dan anything. And I still remember the time when I was somewhat down because uh, of how the Freudians had treated me once I said there was such a thing as sexual abuse of children. And he said, Jeff, I've been a whistleblower and now you're a whistleblower. It's your time to suffer the consequences, but you must do it because there is nothing more important than the truth. And I think for people, it's important for them to recognize that this is only one of the few people on earth who cared more about the truth and love before anything else. He was completely uncorruptible. And he had such a capacity for love. He loved people. He even loved flowers. I remember going with him on a walk when he suddenly whipped out his camera and said, look at that flower. And he took a picture of it. It made him so happy. And people must not believe that he was completely preoccupied with uh, the terrible things that were happening in the world. He was, but at the same time, he saw the beauty around him. He saw the beauty in the love of his life, Patricia. He and I used to love to talk about how much we loved the people we were living with. Uh, me, Lila, and him, Patricia. And I love that he would do that. I just love that man so much. I can't believe he's gone. There is the Dan Ellsberg everybody knows. And then in my view, there's my Dan, the dear close friend, the role model I'll miss to my last day. The last time I spoke with Dan, he said to me, the motto of my life has been, if you haven't had too much, how do you know when you've had enough? Dan, as we know, those of us who are close to him, loved to try everything, do everything, and do it more. And that's how he was my role model. Of course, he was that because he was full of the utmost integrity and more patriotic than most. But he wasn't merely patriotic for America. He was patriotic for the human race. He rooted for us to succeed put his body on the line to block short-sighted moves that might lead to our annihilation. He saw 
the human experiment as being one of beauty and potential, but also one that would require of its most conscious citizens vigilance and work. We all know he was pessimistic about the future, but he was also unabashedly exuberant, enthusiastic, excited by ideas and life. Dan did not merely get up off a chair, he bounded. He didn't just walk, he lunged. He didn't just swim, he plunged into the ocean. There are some people who are bright stars on earth who lead a way forward and who leave a glow behind when they die. But I know he's in his element with the stars. And if I know Dan, he's having exactly enough. I miss him. There's so much to adore about Dan Ellsberg. But what I adore most about him is almost the opposite of his public presentation. He was known as influential and knowledgeable, widely read, very thoughtful, um, and very informative. What I loved about him, and I feel very lucky to have gotten to participate in, was his insatiable curiosity. The guy couldn't stop wondering, rethinking things. Famous people tend to get kind of well, I, can, I call it hardening of the smarteries. That is, whatever brought them their fame, they'll stick with it, or at least they won't continue to be curious. Why would they? They've already got power and influence. That was not Dan. I was lucky to get to have three visits with him uh, just towards the end. And the conversations were astonishing. The guy's 92 years old and he's asking questions. He's invisible. He's not a famous person. He's an, he's an interpreter of the world. We would get lost in these conversations where neither of us had to demonstrate any of our prowess or anything. We were just curious together, sitting on a porch in the universe, trying to understand it and us in it. To the very end, he kept that childlike curiosity alive. That is rare, and especially rare in famous people. Some of our last conversations, he was writing down uh, the names of books he, was, uh, he wanted to read. I mean, he had weeks left. He knew it. He would be dismissive. I mean, not dismissive, but he would, if I asked about his health, he would give a report, but that wasn't of consequence. He was still paying attention to the wider world. It's astonishing to see in a 92-year-old, in a famous 92-year-old, this kind of curiosity. He said, I'm gonna order these books. I don't know if I'll get a chance to read them, but I'm gonna order them. Oh, I'm gonna miss that man so much. We are nearing the end of Dan's celebration with a special guest remaining. We hope that you've been lifted and found comfort in what's been shared today. My heart is full as I am reminded of Rabbi Morris Adler's beautiful words. Those I have loved, though now beyond my view, have given form and quality to my being. They have led me into the wide universe I continue to inhabit, and their presence is more to me than their absence. Now Patricia will offer final remarks, followed by a last special tribute. It's like, I think you can imagine what this tribute has mean to me, this, this ceremony. I've heard some of the individual tri tributes but to sit here for the length of this program and see how many people loved Dan and how many people he loved. I've always admired him for his courage and his bravery and his integrity. I could go on and on, but I've never seen him as so effusively loving and so much loved. It warms my heart so much. 
I, I loved him immensely. I cast my whole vote <laughs> in being with him, being there for him. But this ceremony makes me so proud and even expands that love, if possible, uh, to feel the enormous privilege and blessing of having been his wife for 53 years. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, tributers. Thank you, friends. It's been an extraordinary experience listening to you, and there are more, more tributes on the website. Um, we, as a family, are so appreciative of this effort on so many people's part to really make a tribute to that marvelous man, my hero, and other people's hero, Daniel Ellsberg. Thank you so much for being here and for these wonderful tributes. Yeah. Uh, now we're going to hear a, a poem recited um, that Dan cherished uh, by the guest of honor himself. I'm blessed with having a number of friends that recall to me a poem by Stephen Spender. I think continually of those who are truly great, who from the womb remembered the soul's history through corridors of light where the hours were suns, endless and shining, whose lovely ambition was that their souls still touched with fire should sing of the spirit clothed from head to foot in song, and whose lovely ambition was that their and who clutched from the springing branches the desires falling across their bodies like blossoms. What is precious is never to forget the endless delight of the blood drawn through rocks and worlds before our earth, or its pleasure in the simple morning light, or its grave even demand for love. Never to allow gradually the traffic to smother with noise and fog the flowering of the spirit. Near the snow, near the sky, near the snow, near the sky, in the highest field, see how these names are fettered by the waving grass and by the whispers of wind in the listening sky. The names of those who in their lives fought for life. They wore at their hearts the fire center. Born of the sun, they traveled a short while toward the sun and left the vivid air shined with their honor. 